All right, good morning, and God bless you, and welcome to whomever is joining us at whatever time or whatever place from which you are taking part. We're glad we can, as I, as I often say, be together this way. Uh, this is a special Sunday. It's an historic uh, day because Anna and John are in the house. They're back after many months. They, they have been with us watching the live stream and then watching the uploads of the classes and of course you've been in our hearts and prayers and we know that we've been in yours but to just look out and lay eyes on you uh, is a is a wonderful thing we praise God for that and we're so we're so glad I wanted to do this here at the beginning of class because of obviously what's going on in the in the world right now but you can go to YouTube and find a lot of videos of uh, Ukrainian Christians and of hymns, uh, of church services, of underground services, of people in shelters and what have you. But the two, the, the prayer I'm about to play, because we're, we're going to be praying here, and uh, the song, these are some of our brothers and sisters in the churches of Christ there. And I don't know if you saw this, but what you're about to see is uh, a prayer from some of our, our brethren there who are having to leave their homes. And this is when they were having to flee to the west uh, as Russia was rolling in uh, from the east. And so they're gathered together praying here, and, and we're going to be praying for them. So I just wanted you to hear. I don't have a translation of the prayer but I hope this works here, so let me try this. Спасибо тебе, что ты дал нам потрясающую, замечательную жизнь здесь, на земле, на самом благословенном мире. Мы славим тебя и благодарим за это. Мы имеем Иисуса. Аминь. And then this hymn. Now this might be a little bit loud. These are some in the church there in a shelter and they're Obviously, they just had a meal together, you can tell, and that, um, and now they're singing together. Well, I, I just I can't stop watching that. It's very uh, touching. It's very sobering, and and I, you're going to hear me say some of these things in connection with the sermon this morning about uh, the gospel of peace and peace in the midst of a uh, world and, at war. And so please bear with me with the repetition, but I wanted to say a prayer together now uh, and in, obviously include that in our prayers, but it, it's sure it, it must give them, uh, it must make the fellowship they're experiencing sweet and precious in a way that we maybe can't even understand and to be able to worship together and not knowing what's on the horizon horizon for them but but of course they're trusting that God holds all things in his hands as we do also so let's pray together Holy Father our great God in heaven God of peace God of mercy God of comfort we praise your name and we thank you that 
we can call upon you and we, we enter into your presence in the name of Christ our Lord to offer you our thanks, Lord. We're so blessed to be redeemed by his blood and to have peace in Christ and have the hope of eternal peace and eternal life. We're thankful for Christ and his victory over sin and death and that we share in that victory and we share in his reign and that we have joy in the hope of his coming, Lord, and we know uh, that you have blessed us in him beyond measure. And we're thankful here in America in this time in which we're living that we can come together this way in, in the security and comfort of this hour without the fears and the turmoil and the chaos and the bloodshed that so many others have endured in times past and are enduring around the world. And especially we think now of what's happening in Ukraine, oh God, we, we pray for our brothers and sisters there that you would protect them and show mercy unto them and that you would work in them to hold forth the light of the gospel in the darkness and that your truth might bring hope and healing to many souls there, that they might stand fast and trust in you, oh God. And we ask for the Ukrainian people and for the Russian people as well we pray for your will to be done in this and for you to bring glory to your name and the expansion of your kingdom there and here in our midst. And we know we have right here among us souls who are suffering, Father, and we're thankful that you care about everything that is happening in the world and you care about everything that is happening in our lives and in the lives of each one of us. What love, Father, you, you have for us. So we, we're thankful for that. Lord, and may we be instruments in your hands to build each other up and to bring the hope of Christ to, to those around us, to edify one another. And we pray, dear God, that you'd glorify your name in us, in our, in our children and in their classes and in our worship this day, and that your will would be done in us and in all things now and forever, O oh God, for we ask it in the name once more of Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, thank you for letting me do that. You know that I like to work in cultural matters and current events and try to make all of this relevant to what we're talking about. And, and that's why we're going to go into now what we were starting to address at the end of class last time. Here in, in Romans 13, we're talking about our relationship to the state to the powers that be, to civil authorities, and our obligation to be in submission to them. And you remember, this is, this is tremendously important. We pointed out that um, Paul says civil authorities, when they punish evil, they're acting as God's agent. And that when, when the law is violated to do good, he talks here about how the state does good and praises those who who do good, who are living according to the law. So in order to do that, it's necessary for there to be consequences for violating the civil law or rejecting civil authority. And those consequences, remember we said, are retributive, that it's a matter of punishment, it's a matter of justice. And the language here is very important. We said the language when Paul says, uh, that the civil authorities act as servants of God and that they bear the sword. We should fear them because they bear the sword. So the sword means the government is authorized to use deadly violence for the protection of the innocent. So this is where I like to pause. I did this a little bit, but not in the way we're doing it here. When we went through the Pentateuch and as we went through the Law of Moses and we, we saw the penalties there that we know in, under the Old Testament dispensation, as we call it, that uh, there was capital punishment. And in fact, capital punishment was extended beyond capital crimes to, to numerous offenses. And we're not, we're not advocating here execution for you know, petty larceny or uh, just any crime, but matters of, of great consequence. Uh, of course, but uh, what we're saying is un under the New Testament of Christ, this is still very much a part of, of God's moral order that is the use of um, the, the sword or, or 
deadly violence by the state in, for example, capital punishment. Uh, this is where I like to pause and talk about this as we go through scripture these issues arise and so I like to stop since we're not having an ethics class where we address all these kinds of things uh, together we can do that sometime and I'd like to do that sometime but since we're not doing that in a systematic way I like to do it as we go through the text so I'm hoping this will be a resource then too for people who have questions about it later and we can refer them to what we're talking about here so at the end of class I mentioned that it, it is a travesty, a moral travesty, that uh, many states here do not have, even have the death penalty in, in, in our own nation, that only 24 states have it. And I wanted to expand this now. I can refer you back to what we said at the end of class last time, but really we're going to get all that in here. When we look at the world, the global situation and where do we see notice that 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 light green or that sort of teal color is where uh, the the death penalty has been abolished and where it's red like you see Russia there it's legal but hasn't really been practiced in recent years it's a, it's been essentially abolished so but notice where where do we see it principally missing You know, in the West, right? In the in modern Western culture is where we, we see that with the rise of secularism and the abandonment in the West of the Christian worldview that formed the basis of the foundation of modern Western civilization, uh, w that's where we're seeing opposition to this. And so that's something uh, worth looking at and, and thinking about these trends here in the West, they, um, they're alarming. So w what I'm going through here is, w or the reason I'm going through what I'm about to is it's important for us to be able to, as I say over and over, first of all, we need to understand ourselves, the biblical ethic on the sanctity of life, and that's what this relates to. And then we need to be equipped and be able to give a defense, 1 Peter 3.15, to be able to articulate these things and reason with people and make the case. So let's go through this. What, you remember last time we began here, what is the principal objection to capital punishment? The idea that it's wrong to kill, right? So you have this simplistic idea and just because some are not going to go back and see what we had at the end of the last class. I'm just going to include this. People protesting the death penalty, notice, have from the Decalogue, thou shalt not kill, as though all, all killing is wrong. And you remember this one? I had some strong words about the, the moral inanity of, uh, of this idea. Well, how, how can you kill people to show that uh, killing people is wrong? Isn't that contradictory? And so th this, is the, this is the mentality. But, but we said, obviously, the Bible again and again makes a distinction between killing that is wrong and killing that is right, authorized and, and unauthorized taking of human life. You see that in just the penalty for murder in Scripture in the Old Testament. Now, I know people will say, well, that was the, in the Old Testament, and that was a barbaric age and that was a primitive time in human history and God was accommodating that period and now we live under the loftier ethic of Christ where now it's turned the other cheek now you don't take vengeance right ah that's why I said it in the last class in Romans 12 when Paul said we're not to avenge ourselves we don't take personal vengeance he says leave it to God but you see then he goes right into chapter 13 right into this material where he says one of the ways we leave it to God is God's use of the state to render vengeance to evildoers so we're gonna look at the Genesis 9 passage in just a minute but what, what I wanted to bring up is people will often say how can Christians be opposed to abortion and be pro-capital punishment. How can you be opposed to abortion, the argument goes, on the grounds that it's taking life, and then turn around and say, but we are for taking life and capital punishment. 
innocent life. Right. We don't oppose abortion on the grounds that it's taking innocent life. And I would even argue there are situations where it's right to take innocent life. Can anyone think of a situation like that? You know, if you, if you have to send in a drone strike or send in a, a, a fighter jet or stop a suicide bomber who's going to blow up a busload of children and the only way you can do it that there's I know this is a crude statement but a uh, term but if, if they're if taking out that person if there's collateral damage if 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 an innocent bystander would be killed but you're saving many many lives I would say in that situation that's a, that's taking an innocent life and we evaluate those risks and we try to minimize those. Now, now, by the way, we do. It doesn't appear Russia is trying to minimize that. But in modern warfare, generally in the West, especially with the U.S., we, we try to minimize that sort of thing, even to the point of putting our own troops at risk to minimize innocent people being killed and taking out the lives of, of the guilty. But it's not because we're opposed to taking life. It's we're, we're opposed, the way I like to say it is we're opposed to the unjust killing of innocent life. The un, not just killing innocent life, but the unjust killing of innocent life. So to, that, to, to, say, to say that, well, you know, what's happening in capital punishment would be the same thing happening in abortion. That's moral equivalence. Like the people who said, when we took out the Taliban and were dropping bombs in Afghanistan, that was just as wrong as what the terrorists did on 9-11, that we were doing the same thing, as though all killing is morally equivalent. And that, that's, uh, again, I argue that's reprehensible. And it's just, look, look the way I want to illustrate this. It's a fundamental distinction, I think, that all people can recognize if they're being honest, right? That not all killing is equivalent. So look at, look at let's say you have this criminal who's about to kill someone. All right, so you have this situation here. Along comes a police officer, right? Or, or would you prefer they call a social worker to come and reason with this uh, killer? Um, Let's take money away from the police and give it to social workers, maybe, so that they can reason with this uh, murderer here. All right, so you have another situation going on here. This man's about to take life, and to prevent that, you have another shooting that's going on here. Okay? Now, my question is, is this over here the same thing as this over here? Now, we all know that's not the same thing, right? Just like self-defense. If someone is attacking your family, your child, you realize that you, using deadly force to protect yourself or others, including, now, now this reasoning would extend to on a national scale in just war situations. If we were Christians in Ukraine, could we take up arms to protect our family, to protect innocent people? See. Here, I'm not saying that Christians should be rushing to war and dying to kill people, but what, to protect your family from unjust aggression. See, we have to care, reason carefully and think carefully about this pacifism, the idea that you know, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mountain uh, was advocating just pure pacifism, that, that you never respond to violence with violence in any situation. That is extremely dangerous. And, it, and as I said, I, I believe arguing that way is morally reprehensible. So let's look at a couple other objections. Um, I hear this all the time. You know that I love true crime, and I watch way too much true crime. And in fact, I've seen some forensic file episodes four or five times. One will come on that Kim hasn't seen, and I'll go, oh yeah, this is the one where she'll go, don't wait, don't, don't tell me. But, because uh, I love the narrator, Peter Thomas. I played a clip from one at the end of class last time. But you hear this all the time. The clip that I played at the end of the class, remember it was a juror arguing that, well, we didn't give the death penalty to this woman who killed her girlfriend and, and dismembered her with a chainsaw and buried her out of jealousy because she thought she was 
romantically interested in someone else. We didn't give her the death penalty because we didn't see that it would do any good for her or for the family of the victim and all that. So what, I, what you hear all the time is, well, it, it doesn't bring the victim back. It doesn't, it didn't, when people say, well, are you happy with the outcome of the trial? A lot of times the family members will say, uh, well, you know, it doesn't bring so-and-so back. But listen, the way I would respond to that is that, yes, of course we know it. It, it will not fully compensate or sort of cancel out the loss of that loved one. But as we've been pointing out here, this is why we established what we did already, it's still necessary for the sake of justice. And that's why I find it appalling what that juror said about not giving the death penalty. Well, we didn't see it would do any good. Yes, it would do good. It would uphold the value of human life by holding people responsible when they take human life, right? So let me bring in that passage from Genesis 9 that I mentioned here in the last slide here, where after the flood, now I know we say, well, that's in the Old Testament. Look, this is a principle given, I believe, to all of mankind. This is before the law of Moses. Now this principle is incorporated into the law of Moses, and under the law it was extended in a way that we wouldn't extend it today. Say for adultery, you could be stoned to death. We wouldn't advocate that today. So that's a complicated discussion. But this is a foundational principle I believe God gives to all mankind that is very much operable today. What does it say? Uh, verse 5, and for your lifeblood I will require a reckoning. So that is, there has to be justice, a repayment here. From every beast I will require it. Now there's a symbolism there to requiring, uh, putting a beast to death who kills a, a person. But again, that's showing the sanctity of human life. And notice he says, from his fellow man I will require a reckoning for the life of man. And then here it is. For whoever sheds, sorry. For whoever sheds the blood of man by man, by man, and I don't believe this is just a statement of, well, this is what's going to happen. If you kill people, someone's going to come after you and kill you. This is a prescription, a prescription. This is a... Uh, 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 not just a declaration, but it, it's, a, it's an imperative. By man shall his blood be shed. But here the reason is tremendously important, and this is where the Christian perspective is so uh, critical here. Why? Why is taking a human life without just cause a crime of such magnitude that you, if you commit that crime, Unless there are some extenuating circumstances, I, I would say in some cases we could allow for that. But if you commit that crime, you forfeit your own right to life. Why is that so important? Because you're taking the life of not, uh, you're, it's not like stepping on a roach or slaughtering a pig or, you know, killing an animal or cutting down a tree. Human life is uniquely sacred. Why? We're made in the image of God. We're God bearers. We reflect the image of God, and that's the reason for that is tremendously important. Now, from the secular view, you can make a case without Scripture, and I suppose even if you don't believe in creation, you can make a case for capital punishment, but I think uh, you cannot make as sound uh, and strong of a case without that perspective of human nature that's so critical to the, to the case. So it upholds the sanctity of life of the victim. But let me ask you this question. I want to say this as well. Not only does executing the murderer uphold the sanctity of the life of the victim, it also upholds the sanctity of life of the perpetrator. How? In what way? In what way? Why would I say you're also showing the value of his life if I'm saying we need to take his life? It's a deterrent. Well, that's the next slide. You're one slide ahead of me, but that, it, it is a deterrent. It, it shows, in deterring others, it's showing the value of the lives of other pot potential victims. People who could be victimized, you're trying to deter that, right? So it's showing the sanctity of human life in general. But why, why, is it, why would we say executing a murderer shows you are upholding the value or the sanctity of his own life? Because his life isn't worth anything. 
instancing murder of somebody else. Uh, well, but I'm saying by killing him, you're showing it is worth something. The, 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 uh, what, what, what I understand what you're saying. It was taken as value. If you don't, if you don't kill the one who, who took that innocent life, then that innocent life had no value. Demonstrate that. Yeah, but that gets us to the mainly, you're, you're, you're still talking about the victim here, right? Have something to do with justice? Well, yes. The only pay, it would be the only payment. You would be saying that his Sir? life has value because he's able to, well, I guess you can even go up so far as like for, for Jesus' life as people that believe in the penal substitution, is that you're looking at now that you can substitute this person now has value because you're able to pay. Well, that's fine. that's that's good. I like that. Yeah, that's along the lines of what I'm getting at. But that is a good point. Why would it, in a way, atone for the life of another person? Because that is because it is a significant penalty to take a, a human life. You're showing his life is valuable in that sense. But Sarah, was that? The victim. And Did you give her permission to speak, uh, Bo? Okay. All right. Well, go ahead anyway, Sarah. You guys work that out. The victim and the perpetrator both have the right of the sanctity, but the perpetrator has lost it. It's gone, just like what happened to Cain and Abel. It's gone, so it, it has to be judged then by the thing that has to happen. It's, uh, I mean, it's all right. a whole thing, but he made that choice to commit the crime. Ah, okay. I like this. See, you start to reason through it. Choice. You see, you're showing the value of his life because you're recognizing he is a free moral agent who is responsible for his actions. When you act like, well, well, you know, really, it's not his fault. Well, we're going to minimize the severity of it as though you, you, when you do that, you're not treating him as an agent who, who is responsible for his actions. You're actually treating, it's sort of like treating him like a child who doesn't know any better or shouldn't be held, shouldn't be punished because, you know, you don't punish your six-month-old because he was giggling and, and thrashing around and knocked your drink over onto the carpet, right? I mean, it, it, you don't hold someone accountable who doesn't have the mental capacity to understand right and wrong. But see, you're treating him like you're giving him his full value by saying, we respect that you are a responsible human agent and, and, and that's why we're holding you accountable for your actions. And when we don't, it's as though you have this infantile treatment of the person, right? And that's degrading to me, not to consider people responsible for their actions. So I love this statement from, Rome, uh, from Numbers. It's a powerful text that to me, speak so well to this. So, and, and as you look at this, by the way, I meant to slide this in here at the beginning. See, this is what people who are protesting the death penalty are arguing. See, no, we shouldn't take, uh, we shouldn't execute a person because all life is precious. Even the murderer's life is precious. He took a precious life. Now, now we can't turn around and do that. His life is precious too. Ah, that's the argument here. Here's another situation where they're protesting uh, the death penalty, all life is precious. You know what I would say? Exactly. Exactly. That's why we're treating him as fully human as well. You get it? You get it? See? All right. Think along those lines. But look at this passage, Numbers 35. In, in, again, I know this is part of the law, but the language is powerful. If anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death on the evidence of witnesses. But no person shall be put to death on the testimony of one witness. Moreover... Now here, what if we just give a person life in prison instead? He says, moreover, uh, you shall accept no ransom for the life of the murderer. Why don't we find him a hundred million dollars? What's your loved one's worth? If someone murdered your loved one, what price tag can you put? If he pays you a price that will say, okay, we don't, we don't have to punish you. You can ransom your life here. We'll let you put up uh, your fortune. No ransom shall be accepted for the life of the murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall be put to death. Now, here's the importance of this. This is why I'm having this whole study with you. And you, uh, you shall accept no ransom for him who has fled to the city. This is in context of the city of refuge. That he may return to dwell in the land before the death of the high priest. Here's why, though. This is what I'm getting at. 
my, my, there, it was frozen. Uh, here's why. You shall not pollute the land. See, it's a moral corruption of the, of the society. You shall not pollute the land in which you live, for blood pollutes the land. And here it is, here it is. Mark this in your Bibles. No atonement can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed in it, except by the blood of the one who shed it. This is the only way, God says, you set it right. No other punishment. Only the death of the murderer. No other punishment would satisfy the demands of justice. Life in prison, solitary confinement, whatever it might be. In fact, I would argue, in some cases, other punishments are cruel in comparison to executing a person. Let them languish on death row for years and years and years and years in isolation is, all, is really more cruel than in a timely way taking his life. Which brings us to the next one. All right. Then, uh, all right, Barry brought this up. It's often argued by looking at statistics that states that have the death penalty don't, it doesn't show a reduction in the murder rate. Uh, so there's a lot of debate in the academic world and social science research whether it's a, it's a deterrent. So people say it's not really a deterrent. Now, first of all, I'd argue that's just on the face of it, intuitively, that's, that's not true. And in the, in the punishment in the law of Moses, when, when people were executed for idolatry and other crimes, what does God say over and over in Deuteronomy? So that others may see it and fear, so that they may not do presumptuously. So in other words, it just inherently is a discouragement to other people if they know they're going to forfeit their own lives. What happened with Ananias and Sapphira when they dropped dead after lying to Peter, lying to God, lying to the Holy Spirit, the rest of the church, it says fear came out over the whole church. I often point this out, right? When, when someone, when our kids were little, when someone would spank their kid in front of my kid, I was like, it gave, my kid's eyes would get really big. And I'd look and I'd go, mm-hmm, see that? Okay, that's what you get if you mouth off like they did. You're not going to do that now, are you? So see, I don't even have to spank my kid if you'll just spank yours in front of my kid because obviously it's a deterrent, right? We understand this is so rudimentary, but why isn't it really an effective deterrent in our culture? All right, I've seen case after case after case. How long do people generally sit on death row? If, if you were taken out Right, for 15, 18, 20 years. I've seen cases go on for 20 years or more. People forget all, I mean, I mean the public forgets, not, not the family. See, and that's cruel to the families. That's cruel to the families of the victims. Justice delayed is justice denied, right? But yeah, you lose some of the deterrent effect. I often argue, take, take the guy who, who just drove out, let me move these over so I can get my stuff in and my OCD will be, okay. The, the one in, in Waukesha who just, he drove his vehicle through a parade of mm -hmm. killed women and children, just ran over people and murdered them. There's no controversy about it. We know he's guilty. He was found to, there's videotape of the incident. He's not denying that he did it. There's, there should be no question in the case. So uh, to me, the only delay might be uh, an examination to make sure he's, he's mentally fit, and that, that could be expedited. That shouldn't take a week or two or maybe three weeks. There's no reason that we shouldn't take a person like that a few weeks later and hang them on the courthouse lawn. Execute them so that they know when you're arrested for murder, you're going you're gonna to lose your life here in just a matter of days. You're going to be dead. But when you know you get multiple appeals and, and you can languish on death row for on and on. You know, Scripture talks about this. Ecclesiastes 8, 11 says, Because sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of men is fully set to do evil. See, that's true with the coming judgment. If every time we sinned, Immediately after the sin, we knew we would go straight to hell. That would be a pretty powerful deterrent, right? But God gives us time and, and allows repentance. See, and I think he's talking about in the big picture, God doesn't punish every evil right immediately, right? And there's a judgment coming. 
with that delay, people feel at liberty to, to commit crime, right? So it, it should be done speedily. And even if it didn't deter anyone, it, it would be necessary for justice. That's the case we already made. But the question I want to ask is, this is where I end up still uh, running out of time here, but, but this relates to the, th this idea, th the soft on crime mentality, a different attitude, a different posture that has taken hold of the elite in our culture and the people that are, are many times on our benches in our courts and uh, who are even making our laws. There's a soft on crime mentality uh, that has re resulted, I want you to think about why, has resulted in a, in a record escalation of crime in our culture right now. Let me document a few cases here, right? All right, this is for 2020, and I put this up at the very end of class last time, but look at the unprecedented spike in the murder rate in major cities, including right here, right? We're talking about people are dying cruelly, violently, because of a change in attitude toward crime and punishment, toward human behavior. It's part of a bigger picture. It's part of a bigger world view. Uh, and here's, I'll just get this in, this graphic. It's kind of a busy graphic, but notice. Look at Austin. Look at Austin for homicide records in 2021, just up the road here, 175% increase. Look, this doesn't just happen in a vacuum. There are reasons for this. It's not random. And, and here in Houston, I remember one, there are many, many cases we could bring up, including law enforcement officers who've lost their lives, but the, the problem right now is the, the re, what's called bond reform, where more and more they're letting people who are arrested for violent assault out, they're letting them make bond. The, the, the prosecutors, the DA will argue, judge, don't let this person out. He's got a long record. He's committed a lot of crimes. We believe he'll reoffend. Hold him until his trial. We don't want him let out of jail. And they're being, they're being let out sometimes without any bond at all, or with very low bond, and they make bond and they go out and commit more crimes, like this one who'd been bonded out set for seven different times and shot and killed his girlfriend, tried to murder her son. And someone put together this uh, graphic here um, that shows, and I know you can't really see it very well, it's low resolution, it doesn't show up that well. But I, I'm just saying there are real people suffering here. Wouldn't love of neighbor wouldn't the biblical ethic of Christ compel us to be offended by this and to speak out against it, to object to it? Uh, look at Houston, the largest city in Texas. It closed out 2021 with 473 murders. Let me continue here and, and then answer the question that I'm raising. And again, this is Harris County right here where we are. And look at... Um, letting out offenders with multiple bonds. Notice how, look at how it's, that escalated here in the last few years. Something changed. Policy changed. Policy changed because of ideology. And people are dying because of that. All right, that's what we need to understand. That's why I'm saying these things matter. And again, uh, Notice that a quarter of the people being arrested are essentially uh, being uh, reoffending. But I think a big part of it was uh, as a result of a, a cultural moment that we were living through. There was this movement to not just defund, but even abolish the police. And here, here's an official. We have congressmen who sponsored the Breathe Act. A bold, strategic, visionary, modern day. Notice this is framed in terms of civil rights. A civil rights act here. And the Breathe Act is all about defunding, defunding the police. And that will somehow empower our community. Ask the people in high crime areas if that has empowered their communities. Divesting federal resources from, incarcer from incarceration. We actually had a congressman argue recently we need to get rid of all federal prisons and all funding of prisons. So again, she probably lives in a gated community and has a security guard, the, the one that I heard saying that. But it's okay, you and I can just 
call our social worker. Wait, don't go yet. Divesting federal resources from uh, in, even incarceration. Well, when they did that in Austin, now, and I was glad to hear the, the, the president say in the State of the Union address that we're, we need to fund the police. So this defund the police movement, we're told, is dead. Well, it, but it's, it's a little late. It's wreaked havoc in our cities. And now we're being gaslighted and told, oh, nobody was ever saying that. But yes, they were saying that. But look in Austin, defunded 150 million, 50% spike in homicides. Look what happened in New York City. Took a billion dollars away from the police. 97% rise in shootings. Is you seeing how an abandonment of the biblical worldview results in suffering, human suffering? Which brings me back to our question. I, I would have liked your input on it, but I didn't leave time. Let me just say this. This is happening because of an abandonment of the biblical understanding of human nature, of human accountability, of crime and punishment, of this utopianism that if we just, people aren't sinful, they're just sick, they just need a, a counselor that, um, uh, and it's almost kind of a virtue signaling. And one of the big arguments being made is, well, it's racist because uh, uh, requiring bond disproportionately affects people of color. And, and actually, that fails to take into account the higher rate of crime being committed by minorities. So that's a, that's a simplistic and invalid argument when you say, well, it's racist. So Manhattan DA in New York City, he said, well, we're not going to prosecute any more uh, he had a whole list of crimes that we're not even going to prosecute anymore. Why? Why? He said, well, because it's racist, because more minorities get prosecuted than whites. Well, it's because of the crime, the disparity in crime rates. That's like saying, well, it's, the death penalty is sexist because we execute more men than women. It's not fair to men. We're executing way more when, men than we are women. What's with this anti-men? Well, we need to get rid of the death penalty. It's anti-men. It's because men are committing all the murders, right? <laughs> Most all of the capital crimes. So, uh, but again, it, this is why we fight for the biblical worldview and the biblical understanding of man. An abandonment of that for the secular utopianism uh, results in real human suffering, loss of life, and, and great tragedy. This is of great consequence, the battle for the hearts and minds of men and the way we think about our world and ourselves and understanding ourselves in relationship to God and His will. That battle is tremendously important and it has everything to do with what's going on in our culture right now. And it's putting our friends and neighbors and us at risk right this very minute. These things matter, and that's why I make no apology for taking this time to talk about this in class. We need to understand not only what is happening, but why, and be able to answer it with truth. So thank you for the extra two minutes. I appreciate that. I have Bucky's with us this morning. Uh, God bless you this morning. Well, class is over, worship is over, but I wanted to take a moment to add a couple of things here that I didn't include in the class that I wish I would have gotten in. I might mention them at the beginning of the next class, but really I'd like them to be a part of this class and reiterate a, a thing or two or elaborate here for just a moment, so bear with me. But we had a little discussion immediately after class and the idea of compassion came up. And a lot of times we hear we hear it argued that we should be against the death penalty on compassionate grounds. I did mention that last week, but I don't think I sufficiently addressed it today or in this class. But the idea that showing compassion for perpetrators of crime, well, we can be compassionate in our execution of, of justice, but what to me is overlooked in this is compassion for the victims. Where is compassion for the, per, uh, the, the people who have suffered because of the perpetration of these crimes? Denying them full and swift justice is showing a lack of compassion for the victims and the victims' families. So when that issue comes up, we really should, should turn it around. It, it, it seems like there's a, a great deal of concern among the progressive elites in our time with compassion toward 
criminals and not so much toward the victims of crime. And that is a gross perversion that where often we, we're seeing people's re, very real suffering and loss being minimized and downplayed or ignored altogether. There's not the same concern, it seems to me, for that as there is in this moral exhibitionism often. Not that sometimes it isn't genuine, motivated by genuine concerns and sincere efforts and, uh, and convictions. But, but, but I think oftentimes it's a, it's a virtue signaling of, look, well, I want to show how compassionate I am toward the perpetrators of crime. What about compassion for the victims? We need to emphasize that to counter that idea that it, when, especially when it's used to, to argue for abrogation of the death penalty. Another thing that comes up that I didn't bring up is forgiveness. All oh, people will say, but what about, what about forgiveness? We should be willing to forgive those who commit uh, even heinous crimes. And we'll even hear family members of victims argue that, well, we forgive the person who murdered our loved one and they, they will sometimes be very vocal in opposing the death penalty for, uh, for the murderers of their loved ones. It's, if you remember the case of, uh, I believe her name was uh, Tammy Faye Tucker. Uh, no, Carla Faye, Carla Faye Tucker. She was executed here in Texas, the first woman to be executed in Texas since, I believe, the 1860s. But her case received a lot of publicity, a lot of attention. She brutally murdered two people years before she was executed. But on death row, she, it is reported, converted to Christianity. And so you had Christians arguing that she shouldn't be executed because she's re reformed and she's changed her life and she's been forgiven. So we need to forgive her and the fact of the matter is, what we need to say in answer to that is forgiveness does not remove all consequences for one's actions, right? You can commit serious crime and have to go to prison and do hard time. You can be forgiven, but that doesn't mean we just throw the doors of the prison open and anytime someone is forgiven, we just say, well, all right, forget all about their sentence. So if we can understand that when it comes to incarceration, we can understand that as well when it comes to capital punishment, when it comes to execution. Keep that in mind. That's an important point to argue that you can be forgiven and go to heaven and still be executed for, for murder. Uh, there are still temporal consequences to our actions that are necessary, as we've been saying all along, for justice for the sake of civil order and retribution. All of that's very important. Now here's another argument I didn't address, but sometimes people will say, well, but we can be wrong. We might make a mistake when we execute people, and therefore we should, we should never have capital punishment, uh, because if we incarcerate someone unjustly, if there's a wrongful conviction and a person's in prison, we can always let them out, and you can rectify it that way, but if we execute the wrong person, there, there's no way, now it's too late, to uh, do anything about it, and so we, we've done this terrible injustice. Well, th the answer to that, I would say, is to exercise great care, to be sure that we have convincing, compe compelling, conclusive evidence before we execute someone. I mean, we have murders where there's absolutely no question that a person is guilty and yet opponents of the death penalty will will oppose execution even in those cases where there is no question and sometimes they'll argue it on the basis of but well but we we might wrongfully execute someone well in this case that's not an issue in in, in a particular case they'll still argue it even though in a particular case it's not at issue where guilt is absolutely certain, where a person may even confess that he's done it, be glad that he's done it. We may have videotape and multiple witnesses and all of that well established. So yes, we should exercise care to eliminate wrongful convictions. Still another 
objection we sometimes hear is that uh, the death penalty is not administered in a fair and just way, that there are biases that are built into our judicial system. In other words, certain people tend to get convicted more uh, and other people will find that some people, it, it would seem, or it's argued because of their status, because of their race, uh, because of their whatever privilege or position, they're not as likely to get the death penalty as maybe other people are. And so sometimes it's argued that capital punishment is, is enforced in a racist way, in an unjust way. Well, if that's true, then the answer, as far as I'm concerned, this is what I would argue, is, well, the answer to that is to be sure that we are even-handed and just in our application of our laws. The, the answer to an abuse is not an abrogation of the thing being be abused, uh, not necessarily. The answer is to reform it. The answer is to ensure that it is done properly. Think of, again, incarceration. There are, there, it may very well have been the case, well, certainly we know it is the case in the past, that we have incarcerated people unjustly and there have been racial biases. But that doesn't mean we say, well, therefore we're not gonna put anyone in prison anymore. You know, it may be the case that you have jurors who are racist or who, who are not impartial. There may be biases in there, there may be conscious and unconscious biases in jurors, in district attorneys, and prosecutors. I think if that's the case, if evidence can be shown that that, that is the case, well then that calls for uh, reform, not abrogation. That would be, I think, a good way to respond to that. So again, a lot to think about there. There are these other objections that come up and we, we need to know how to help people think through them and, and to be able to make a, as I said earlier, a good reasoned argument. But finally, this last thing to me that is important, and it, and it came up, someone brought it up in the class, and that is to view this like we should all things in light of the cross of Christ. Jesus' death on the cross is central to Christian ethics for numerous reasons, but when we think about it here, Think of the fact that we sin, and because of our sin, we learn from Romans and throughout Scripture, the wages of sin is death. We deserve death. And the only way our sin can be atoned for, like, like that passage we saw in Numbers, is through death. That Christ had to suffer as the sinless, spotless Lamb of God he had to suffer death in order to atone for our sins. So there had to be an execution to pay for my sin in order to satisfy the demands of God's justice. And that's what Paul's talking about in Romans, right? That's what he's emphasizing that we've looked at again and again already in our class in Romans 1 and especially Romans 3, 23 through 26, because sin deserves death. You know, how can God be a just God, a righteous God, and, and hold sinners and count sinners as justified and not hold us guilty of our sins, as he says in Romans 4 when Paul cites uh, Psalm 32. We looked at all of that because of what Jesus did as a substitute dying in our place. He bore the wrath of God. He's the propitiation for our sins. He appeases the wrath of God. He satisfies the demands of God's justice so that you and I can be forgiven. But in order to do that, he had to die. So my sin, it had to be paid for with death, right? And so that's why Paul says God can be just and the justifier of sinners, the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. So once again, the cross sheds light on this whole issue of justice. Now, of course, Jesus' death was unjust. He uh, suffered a cruel and horrific, barbaric execution. He was tortured to death on the cross. And certainly we wouldn't argue for executing anyone in such an inhumane way. But the cross still does show us that the, the, the gravity of sin, the magnitude of sin, 
And what is Paul talking about in Romans 13 here? The God's vengeance, God's punishment against sin. And we see that my sin had to be punished through the death of Christ, uh, of our Lord Christ. So think, think of the whole issue in light of the cross of Christ, just as we should think of all things in light of the work of Jesus on Calvary, his death and his resurrection. You see how that informs the whole Christian ethic. So these are very weighty matters, tremendously important, especially the, the sanctity of life issues. Again, I have to say it one last time here that when we abandon the biblical worldview and our understanding of ourselves and our world and right and wrong, we see that it, it ends up undermining the sanctity of human life as made in the image of God. And that's why we're seeing such uh, tragic human suffering uh, because of the secular worldview, uh, because we're, we're abandoning the biblical understanding of ourselves and our world. And that's why uh, this is so critical. So I just wanted to say that again. Thank you for a few extra minutes to reiterate these things and elaborate a little bit more. I hope this was helpful to you. And may God help us to think through these things carefully in light of his word and uphold his truth. God bless you.